Hey, hey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very eventful morning here at the Widener household. Uh, up early to prepare, as Robin did a women's event, a virtual women's event, for the Easter region of the Johannesburg Church in South Africa. So to be on their time zone, uh, an early start for us. But the exciting thing was that um, we opened it up and there were women there from 30 different countries uh, around the world, from Africa, India, uh, Australia, uh, Europe. It was an amazing event and um, I got to listen because I was kind of the technical guy in the background and very inspiring, very inspiring to talk about thriving through pandemic. So as a follow up, uh, we're gonna do a continuation and, and go a little deeper in the idea of thriving and about uh, going with the flow. Yeah, yeah, I think the question I put up is, are you in the thickets or in the flow? And uh, definitely there are times I have felt like I am in the thickets. Um, so where that idea comes from is um, actually, you know, those of you who listen up on our Facebook uh, lives know that I really like the Passion Translation right now. It's just giving me a different read. And uh, although it had a single interpreter, it was written from the Aramaic and I've read a lot about his explanation of his interpretation. And I don't know, I find it super inspiring. But John 7:38. It says, believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. And there's a footnote on that word flowing. Hmm. And it says that that word flowing, that in the Aramaic, the immediate thought would be the Jordan River. Hmm. Jordan meaning flowing. Sure. And so I did some research on the Jordan River and it was pretty wild. Um, I mean, the river has, I think it's uh, maybe 850 uh, feet difference, you know, from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And so the water's moving very rapidly. Huh. And uh, someone in, I don't know, in the 1800s, uh, there was one year where there was one point in the river that was a mile, mile wide. Mm. But usually it's more like 100 feet. And usually the depth is four foot to 10 foot, depending on flood season, you know, when flood season is. But during flood season, and even all year, the water is running so rapidly. Hmm. It's so rapid and it's surrounded by thickets on either side where, you know, there were wild animals kind of, you know, I'm sure snakes and who else knows what else got in those thickets. So the thickets were kind of a reason not to cross it and there were even I think no known bridges during hmm. Bible times. But anyways, so when they, he said, when Jesus said this about, you know, that uh, rivers of living water will burst out from within you, um, flowing, you know, then I think their minds immediately went to the Jordan River, hmm. maybe even in flood stage and just this, this, and we, we experience that in Boise, don't we? Um, when the when the water comes down maybe you could explain about that well obviously we live in the land where there's lots of white water uh idaho actually has more white water than colorado um so we have a lot of wonderful quick moving uh flowing rivers and that's how we um irrigate we create reservoirs for all the mountain snow that melts off we catch it in reservoirs and then at the right season uh they open the reservoir and it is a sight. People come out to watch it when they open the gates and let the irrigation begin. It is a massive, massive flow. And of course, also, Idaho uses a lot of that flow to create our electricity. We have a lot of hydroelectric electrical plants here. And so uh, the flow is very important here in Idaho. Yeah, the reason this scripture came to mind, and those of you who are just joining us, thanks for thanks for coming on this morning, and um, just finished a seminar with women from around the world. I think there were 500 on during the seminar, but maybe 850 or so signed up that will get to see it. So that's a lot of women, um, and maybe you said 30 different countries, mm -hmm. 30 different countries, and really 
we came on to examine this idea of thriving during pandemic and how that can even kind of tick you off if somebody suggests, hey, you should be thriving during this pandemic. Hmm. That can almost be like, what? You know, you gotta be kidding. I'm trying to survive. I, I, I Thriving seems out of the question with all the difficulties, hmm. you know, that we're experiencing. And I told about, you know, the things we've gone through from, you know, losing a friend in a motorcycle accident mm. to an earthquake to our neighbor across the street dying right be as the pandemic was just getting ready to start ramping up to uh, a venomous spider bite. And then uh, two weeks ago, I was in a terrible bike accident and flew off my bike right onto my ribs. And I've been in excruciating pain ever since. And I'm like, thrive, you know, thrive during pandemic. You feel like if somebody said that to you, you're like telling them your pain. And they're like, oh, just God wants you to thrive during pandemic. You might be like, I want to slap you right now. Mm. Well, it's interesting, though, because we got to go camping uh, uh, three different times uh, over the summer. We go up next to the Payette River, and you know what? Uh, the Payette River is unaffected by the pandemic. Oh, it is, is it? <laughs> it, is, it is flowing just like it always does. There are tons of rafters out there, and I think that's really, uh, you know, a good illustration of how God, His power is not limited, His ability, the Spirit is not limited to do incredible things, uh, regardless of other situations going on right now in the world. Yeah, so it was super moving because I opened up the chat, which we, you know, we like to do. And in fact, we'd love to hear your comments if you want to put comments about what tough things have happened to you during the pandemic is the question I asked. And women from around the world were sounding in with, you know, people they knew dying, um, hmm. depression, floods, you know, uh, financial crisis, losing jobs, you know, it just was going on and on and on the list of all the things that have happened to them mm. during the pandemic. And I think, uh, first of all, we have to allow our pain before, we, we can't move straight from the pain to thriving. Mm. Like there has to be some room for the pain to be heard and to be uh, metabolized, I guess. Mm. What do you think? You know, it is interesting. Um, certainly, biologically, our brains are wired to take um, time for uh, translation of, of emergencies, of, of fight or flight situations. They don't directly translate into the front brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we have time to think and, and meditate and reason. And so in our biology uh, is designed that to mediate, the medial cortex is designed that it's activated by curiosity, by meditation, by thinking about, um, you know, even by speaking, we activate the prefrontal cortex, but only as we are curious, only as we speak to one another and to God, do things get clarified, do things start to make sense. Yeah, so... So what I hear you saying, all those women speaking their pain was a good thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and speaking all of it, us... Typing it, whatever uh, you have to do. Yeah, yeah. it was like a big pain fest, you know, of all of us sharing our pain. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with thriving? Well, it has a lot to do with thriving um, because we're kind of in a, in a spiritual wasteland right now, in a desert. And, um, and you may not feel that in your own spiritual life, but let's just say the water... It's harder to get. We're not being with people in person. Um, we're all going through difficulties. We're all going through collective trauma. Mm. We've all got things that are getting triggered, perhaps, mm. from our past. And any any shallow roots we have are getting exposed. Mm. And I feel like it's that way with me. There have been days where I'm like, man, am I even a woman of God? You know, um, because. I felt so much despair or I was so snippy with you or I was just having a hard day. And so this idea in John 7, 38, I think Jesus was talking to a people who had gone through a lot of difficulty, mm. who had experienced a lot of oppression from the government, you know, who were looking for a savior, looking for someone to come and provide some kind of deliverance 
And the thing he said to them is, believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, hmm. flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture said. And for those of you who are just joining, we were talking about how that immediately would have taken the Aramaic mind to the Jordan River, flowing. That word flowing is the Jordan River. And how, how it has quite a flow. Um, and, um, but the thing is, there's this thicket around the river mm. that makes it almost impassable. And I think it's easy to get hung up with the thickets mm -hmm. and not get to the flow. Right. Well, I think there's a natural filtering process that goes on in rivers and in underground aquifers. I mean, uh, the purest water is the water that's gone through the most filtering it's gone got through, through the most rocks you mean rocks and, rocks sand, and, and, and incline and all the things that happens for water to trickle down it gets bounced and hit and jiggled and and some of it in the deepest aquifers it even takes years to get down there but that's where some of the the most pure springs come out of these places where the water has it's not just quickly uh water that runs out quickly like we had in illinois it's muddy water. It's not drinkable. It's not pristine water. It immediately hits the ground and runs off. That's not the water that's pure and beautiful. That water is creating erosion. It's causing difficulties. The water that really is, is pure and the water that really is what is beautiful and is most drinkable is the water that's been through the most uh, in the, in the purification as it goes through the rocks and takes its time. Huh, yeah, when we go down to the Payette River, there's a ton of rocks and that water is really spraying and hitting and you never think of it from the water's perspective, right? You, you know, you don't think of water as a living thing. You don't think of it from the water's perspective like all the all the pushing and, and splattering and hitting and moving and funneling and all that stuff going on with water. Um, but I just have this feeling that, that this time can reveal our need for living water mm. more than ever. Mm -hmm. Like when you, us here living in Boise, we live in a desert and every year when the snows come in the winter, people are, are concerned. They're gauging how much snow is up, up on the mountains. They want to know the amount. They want to know the inches. They want to know. And this, this isn't just the people who ski. <laughs> this is because... The amount of snow we get up there directly translates in how much water there'll be for irrigation that year. Mm -hmm. And whether our lawns will be green, whether we'll be able to water, whether how much water the farmers will get, how much water will come through. Whether you have potatoes or not, the potatoes are dependent on the irrigation. And what would the world do without Idaho potatoes? Could be a problem. It might be, I don't know. I think, a, I, heard, I think I heard McDonald's uses Idaho they potatoes. They do. They do. Yeah, Idaho potatoes. What would we do without our potatoes? I wrote a funny little story for the kids at church one year about uh, the year that, that um, the potatoes ran out. Oh, no. And um, it was quite a comical little spin on not having potatoes and how that would ruin Christmas. And then how, you know, Idaho came to the rescue. Um, and provided all the potatoes needed for the whole world because Christmas would be ruined otherwise. But I think um, sometimes in the pandemic, it's easy to feel like the thickets become an obstacle to getting in the flow. Because, you know, collectively we're going through trauma, we're being triggered into trauma, and, and we're not getting the nervous system feedback that our body is created for mm. by in-person relationships. Mm. We're not getting that with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we're feeling, you know, some people just feel outright alone, you know, and we're wrestling down a lot of feelings maybe that we don't even think we can talk about mm. sometimes. And so then this idea of thriving, it doesn't seem like a promise and a blessing. It seems more like, Oh, wow, if you don't thrive, you're doing something wrong. Hmm. Yeah, I think that um, the more I look at the scriptures and the more I understand the, the ways of God, um, you know, even, it wasn't the Jordan, but even in the, in the, the deliverance from uh, the Israelites, 
from Egypt. Um, God took them the long way. He took them the longer path. And sometimes, just like the water, uh, sometimes the longer path is the better path. Sometimes the water path. And, and, and the thing I think of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an inactive pilot. I learned to fly airplanes when I was very young. But <clears throat> the whole idea of flight is based on airflow, airflow, uh, lift. And the reason you have lift on the wing is the top side of the wing is longer than the bottom side of the wing. And so by that air flowing over, taking the longer path, that's what creates the lift that allows these gigantic planes to get off the ground. And I think sometimes that's true in our lives as well. We like to go the, the straight path, but sometimes oh, that's I the see one what you're getting at. That, okay, that, I get it. That, that, that doesn't get you off the ground. <clears throat> the straight path won't get you off the ground. The airflow, the flow has to go the long route. And when it does, uh, it makes a differential in air pressure and ultimately creates lift that takes you up into the sky. And I think that's really, since the spirit and the wind, the word for pneuma, or spirit and wind, are the same word, I like to make those connections because it seems like sometimes the spirit takes us on the long path, uh, through the thicket sometimes, through the difficulties, but ultimately, if you stay with the flow, if you let the spirit lead you, it creates the lift you need to, to thrive, to, to see things from a higher perspective and to make great progress in life. I think as Christians, we've come up with this, this weird thing. Like, um, I had a question today. Um, what if I'm not being given during the pandemic? Mm. And I think we have this idea of being given, giving as this super spiritual thing like, um, hey, I don't even think of myself. I only think of other people. So my conversation is all for other people. My service is all for other people. I lose myself. And it's confusing because there's some truth in that, obviously, right? Mm. That he who, he who uh, loses his life will find it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jesus emptied himself. There's all these beautiful analogies that have to do with that. But I think um, we kind of misread that as like the straight path of spirituality. Pandemic comes, trouble comes, I trust God, therefore I thrive. And it's not like that. Mm -mm. And actually what I suggested to the sisters today is that um, being giving, one of the greatest gifts you could give is your vulnerability. Mm. Is saying, okay, this week I felt like a slouch. I didn't feel like I had anything to give. I was feeling depressed. I ate too much. I watched a bunch of shows. Um, could you pray with me? And letting somebody, you know, minister to you and help take you to the conduit where the Spirit's flowing mm -hmm. could be the most giving thing you could do. Mm -hmm. People are really drawn more to our weakness than they are to our strength. But I, I see Jesus' life as, um, as going with the flow. I think of, of John 3 when it talks about the Spirit, that the Spirit comes and, and you don't know where it's coming from, where it's going and that he guides in ways that um, are sometimes unexpected. But you look at Jesus' life, and sometimes he took time, just downtime with his disciples, downtime to have a good meal, go to a party. Uh, but uh, sometimes he went to the wilderness. Sometimes he went up on the mountain to pray. It, it really was a life guided by the flow of the Spirit. And I think that's... Not by the pressure to give. Like, here, I'm the Son of God. I better be giving all the time. Right. It was a life. And if you know me, I like to go with the flow. I mean... <laughs> oh, boy, do you like to go with the flow. I, this man likes I, to go with the flow. I am a free-flowing flow. person. But hopefully, if I'm aligned with the Spirit, uh, it's okay. And that's that's the idea of, of spaciousness, is that it's okay. It's okay. Uh, if, if I'm in line with the Spirit, if the Spirit leads me up to the wilderness to camp, well, Amen. Uh, that's wonderful. I, I find him there. If the Spirit leads us uh, to give to the homeless man, that's fine too. But obviously learning to be in touch with the Spirit and follow his guidance is the way I would define going with the flow. Yeah, I think the pandemic can expose clogs in the flow. You know, places where we've got the conduits shut off. Mm. And I mean... I know for me, uh, one thing I was sharing with the sisters this morning is three years ago, I kind of entered a crisis of faith. And that's where, 
you know, Purity Restored had gone full time, but yet I felt like everything you wanted me to do, I was almost fighting you on. You know, I was struggling to want to go, to want to do, struggling with my health. Am I going to have the health to do that? Can I really do that? Do I, you know, do I have the heart to do that? And, and my faith, I felt like I had a ceiling over me that I didn't know what it was. And at that point, Dave Mitchell entered my life, you know, and suggested a trial coaching session, which I'd never considered in my life or even thought was necessary or even. And, um, and I think I had a stuck conduit and, uh, you know, a conduit that was, had a, a lid on it. And so Dave had me do this uh, evaluation that looks at the bright energy in you and the dark energy in with you and what's dominant. Hmm. And he found that I had all this bright energy that was up like a nine out of 10. And he's like, oh, that's amazing. That's so rare. You know, that's an amazing gift. You know, hardly anybody has that, you know, wow. But I was waiting for the butt. I knew there was a butt coming just the way he was talking. I was waiting for the butt. And finally, he's like, but there's another level of energy in you. And that's a level two energy. I'm mm -hmm. like, a level two? He's like, yeah, it's a dark energy. Mm -hmm. And you know what it was? Competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And it's like from my trauma, you know, as a kid, sexual abuse. And, you know, I had a great childhood in many ways. But unfortunately, some sexual abuse happened at different places, different stages, and then my dad's alcoholism during my teen years, I maladapted, mm. and I learned to be stronger, and I learned to be bigger than it, and I learned to outperform it, and I learned all these, but all of those were competitive in their nature without me even realizing it, because if I have to be stronger than something, then I have to be stronger than other people, or it, it almost made it like God's grace was um, apportioned more to people who performed and less to people who didn't perform as much. Hmm. So there was this miss, there was this thing, and it would come out in me in really surprising ways, and I'd catch it and I'd push it back down, but I'd never really opened that conduit and got super curious about hmm. what was there and why it was there. And at first it was just super distressing, but then as I began unpeeling, unpacking that thing through coaching sessions, and really what helped the most was I went through like two Bibles full of Bible journaling. And many of them were on grace being a hose that has a big spray and performance being a leaky hose and, mm. you know, grace enough for everyone. And I began making this, like God took that spiritual crisis and that, that ceiling over me and he used it to show me something I've been needing to see for, even though I'd written three books by then right I mean I needed to see that I needed to see that mm. dark vein in me and it was painful to see it but then I was able to bring Jesus there and be curious and it began this transformation that led me to this point that I would even be online all this much and that my view of ministry and myself has made another, like new life has come up. New life has come. The conduit got the top off and it's spraying water everywhere. And I'm figuring out how to live more in the spirit. But if I hadn't had that crisis three years ago, mm -hmm. I don't know where I would be right now. Right, right. Well, I think that um, we've been studying out uh, with some of the brothers we've been talking about uh, the cross and and, and sin and all the things about it and and I really was praying for a, a new perspective and I really started seeing how the reason why God hates sin is because sin hurts us so much it's not that it's it's so much it's like a, a, a parent seeing their child struggle or seeing their child fall and you it, you're just sad that they're hurting so much and I think the reason why God hates sin is he loves us so much that when we're in the thicket, it, it hurts him because uh, he is wanting us to thrive. He's wanting us to flow. He's and, wanting the Jordan River in our lives. Right. He's wanting us to, and, to feel the flow. <laughs> and all the years I was stuck in sexual addiction, um, it wasn't that he was just like, ooh, gross, yuck. Um, no, he was like, Dave, this is, 
this is hurting you. This is causing your relationships pain. It's hurting your marriage. It's hurting your, your confidence. All the ways it was preventing me from thriving and flowing. And so uh, it really helped me to understand when we see God as a loving God, that his hatred of sin is not because sin is some kind of an abstract, ooey, yucky, dirty. No, he hates sin because he loves us so much and he wants us to thrive. Even when he called Saul, who became Paul, it's interesting, he said, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks? Or why do you kick against the thorns? Like, you're in a thicket. You're in a thicket. Because thickets usually have lots of thorns. Yeah, they do. And, 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 <laughs> Saul, like and Saul was like kicking against the thorns. He was saying, you're hurting yourself. It hurts me because I see your potential. I see how much you could do and how you could thrive. But you're, you're stuck in the thorns. And you're kicking against them. And it's making you more and more, putting more and more pain inside you. And that's when Saul became Paul. And eventually then, talk about flowing. Uh, he really flowed with God's power. Yeah, and maybe also, honey, maybe um, God looked at you and he saw parts of you he wanted to enter. But the conduit wasn't open. Mm -hmm. You know, because when we... When we pour all our energy, like me, into performance or you into sexual addiction or whatever, right? Then there's, there's only like the flow's been misdirected, mm -hmm. and we're using different pipes, and you know we're we're in leaky pipes that never satisfy. And um, but maybe part of God's hurt over it is just His longing to flow through you and longing, you know, to flow through me. And to be in every part of us. The water becomes stagnant. And the longer it stays stagnant, uh, the more toxic it can get. And it needs to flow to stay pure. And I believe that's the, the real heart of what God wants for us. Yeah, so I think I, I started to think about with this pandemic that what God wants for us is to come out of it more alive instead of simply having survived, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the question. Those of you who just joined us, are you living in the flow or the thickets? The flow being the flow, the Jordan River flow of the rivers of living water flowing through us. The conduits are all open. You know, it's come, we've looked up because we had no control. We couldn't grow ourselves and we looked up. We looked for God to be the one to bring the water down the mountains, through the purification, through the conduits, into our heart, so we can really experience the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he wants us to live, to be alive. And it's funny, the roots of the word alive, if you look back to 1823, there's an allusion to when a woman's pregnant, hmm. and there's something called quickening, and that's when the baby begins to kick hmm. and you feel those little flutters, right? The, I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. <laughs> well, you'd know when they got enough that you could feel I them. did know that, yes. 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 But it's a sense that we're, we're alive and kicking, you know, that we're not laying back and letting our trauma, per, per, you know, responses have the day, letting our coping mechanisms just run the show because our nervous system remembers them and gets them going, but we're standing up and saying, well, wait a minute. I want to I wanna explore some new conduits, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to experience flow. And so we're going to try out some new coping mechanisms. And we're going to try out, you know, we're going to look for God's wraparound presence. That's really what we were talking about this morning is how, how does that, how does thriving meet the wraparound presence of God? Right. And what's your thought on that? Well, I think it's good that... Um we're finding those things, and whether it's um, um, for us uh, developing walks up the hill uh, to find golf balls, which, by the way, I, I found 30 balls last <laughs> night, an all-time record. Um, but uh, you had to dig hard. You went down a hill like where people hit them way along and found a whole bundle of them down at the bottom of a drainage ditch or something, right? Right, right. But the thing is, we're finding new ways to experience God and, and uh, whether it's riding bikes or running golf balls or working in the yard, hopefully you're finding those areas where you're seeing God work and blessing and hopefully they're lifting you. Hopefully they're lifting you because this may, not, this may go on for a while 
and we want it over. Sometimes we want it over. We want to be out of the thickets really quickly. Uh, but sometimes God says we can take the long path, and if we allow Him to purify us and cleanse us during this time and find new uh, hobbies, new passions, new things that will lift us, those could be lifetime lifetime things. Although the golf ball thing will not be a lifetime thing because we already have over 300 and we're going to be... Um, I think we're about done. I think we're about done. But <laughs> the walking up the hill at sunset, now that could be a lifetime thing. That could be a lifetime thing. And going out to pray as this, the day ends, that could be a lifetime thing. And if we find those things, then maybe we'll look back someday on the pandemic and say, wow, that was a good time. That was a good time because I learned more about how to live in the spirit. Yeah. I think what I hear you saying is that, you know, we, I make thriving all about me. And I don't know if you guys do that too. You know what I mean? Like I have to thrive and I can try to gut myself into thriving, but really thriving comes from outside of me hmm. is what, so this scripture in Psalm 18, 30 through 31, God doesn't want us to thrive in and of ourselves. Um, he says, I am the wraparound God. I will cover you from every side. I will go before you to give you courage for what you do not see. I will come behind you to protect you from what you don't see. I will stand beside you when it gets tough, tough and suffer with you. And I see so much in there about a God who wants to participate with us in the thriving, hmm. who wants to be the thriving because he's covering us. He's out in front as a guide. He's behind because there's a lot of stuff that's confusing about this pandemic and stuff. We don't know which end is up. We don't know how to make decisions. Every decision seems life-threatening. He's behind us. He's beside us, you know, uh, because it's going to get tough and he wants to suffer with us. So part of God's definition of us thriving is him suffering with us, which hmm. to me means I need to be in touch with the suffering. Mm. I don't have to cram it away or pretend like I'm bigger than it or pretend like it's not an issue. I can suffer, but letting him suffer with me mm. puts me in the flow. Wow. wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I think that um, in these times also, uh, if we can let others into our, our suffering as well, and, and I've been privileged to be with some brothers in India on a regular basis, and sharing our hearts with each other. It's just been such a delight, such a delight to build this friendship. And, um, and so I think, yes, looking for opportunities where God's Spirit is leading us to create uh, new pathways, new pathways, and in sharing our sufferings with one another. And, and my, hearing about uh, those in India and the suffering they're going through, it, it, it just, I couldn't shake it yesterday. It was on my heart all day long. People living in houses that are filled with two or three feet of water. They're gushing in almost every day because of the flood season and trying to survive. And he sent me pictures of what it looked like. It was just uh, horrendous. And I, I felt some of their suffering. And um, that was a good thing for me. It made me very grateful. But obviously, letting people into our suffering is it's very important. Yeah, um, I showed Dave this uh, YouTube yesterday. Um, I think it's called the Soccer Grannies of South Africa. Since I was doing this South African Women's Day, I was just wondering if they use the, um, the phrase, kicking and alive. And so I looked it up and I found out about these women and they're age 65 to 85. And they just experienced a lot of loss and uh, maybe losing children. Many of them had lost children to AIDS so they were raising all the grandchildren, maybe, you know, eight to 12 grandchildren, trying to put food in their mouth, trying to make food to sell lunches, to do anything. And so when one of them went to the hospital, she noticed that the hospital was full of older women. And she's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So she started an aerobics group that went to a field and some kids were playing soccer and they kicked one to one of the grannies and the grannies kicked it back. And then another granny kicked it and another granny kicked it. And the women loved it so much that a guy volunteered to coach them and they became a soccer team, like an 85 year old woman. It's hilarious watching it. You know, I won't give you the gory details, but he says some funny things. 
But this coach is like a Jesus figure because he's like, okay, I must know everyone that's here because you're all older. I have to find, find the ones that aren't here. You know, he's like, you may be my grannies and you may have borne the children that born me, but when you come on this field, you are in, you are my child. You are in my training. I am training you. And these grannies found that they could kick. And one of them started running three miles a day and so, and they practiced kicking goals. And a girl you learned to goal 10, one of the younger ones, the 60 sums, you know, learned to goal 10. And before you know it, this started spreading all over South Africa and they started having tournaments and he's getting sponsors for them so they have money to feed their grandchildren. And they're saying they go to in, where the, in this little village that they li live in, they said that it's just not uncommon for houses to get broken and rapes to take place or, or them to break your stuff or steal your stuff or even kill you. So before that, they were living in fear, but the fear drove somebody to do something and people to get involved and they found their kick, mm -hmm. you know, but they needed a coach, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They found their flow. They're out on a field acting as a team and some of them are like 80. And it's amazing because actually, like they're catching the balls up here and they're, you know, they're, they're, man, they're all in it. Let me say, they're all in it. But, um, and I think that's the idea of being alive as we're stepping up to the plate and we're, we're kicking, you mm -hmm. know, and we're, a lot, we're coachable. Like the one woman said, they all fear the coach, but they all love him. Mm -hmm. And when one of them fell down, he's like, and they all just were looking like, oh no, she fell down. And he's like, listen, when one falls down, you don't just watch. You all come running and you get her up. And he told the one that fell down, this is your medicine. And that was good for me to hear because just two weeks ago, I was lying on the concrete. I had flown off my bike. I'd landed on my ribs. My my knee and my elbow were caught at a puncture room on my white on my left hand and I didn't know if I'd broken my ribs or what had happened, but I was laying there. And when he said, this is your medicine, falling is your medicine. I was like, how profound, falling is your medicine, that falling can help you get back in the flow. Mm -hmm. Falling can help you find your flow again. And to me, that was just so profound. Mm -hmm. So as we close, um, are you in the thicket? Are you in the flow? And obviously, uh, if you're in a thicket, uh, God is saying, why are you kicking against the thorns? Um, I want you to have life. I want you to flow. I want you to be led by the Spirit. I want to release you, uh, not from the troubles, but to release you from a mindset that's, that's confined and that's negative and show you how that even in pandemic, He can be very present and very active and open up new ways, new ways of life that someday we'll look back and say, this was a blessing and not a curse. To, for my closing, I'd like to just teach you a little exercise we do, we've been doing in our trauma groups. And that is that pain needs to be balanced. And so, you know, um, the first is to tap your heart and say, pain, you're welcome to speak. Because what, what we're talking about today, pain is part of the thriving, falling down is the medicine, you know, pain, you can speak. And we need to hear each other's pain without trying to fix each other, without throwing uh, spiritual platitudes at each other, like trust God, are you praying? Have you had, you know, don't throw any spiritual platitudes out. Really hear another person's pain. Hear their pain. And then tap your head, and that is prefrontal cortex. Pain can't have the whole story. You know, spirit... You get to talk to reasoning. I need you on. I need you awake because you're the counterbalance. You're the, you're the voice that will help integrate the pain and make sense of it so that I can be in the flow, so that I can hear the spirit, so mm -hmm. that I can really thrive. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. We love and, you. And uh, God bless. Did cut it off. Bye, everybody.